Hello and welcome to How to Use eLearning and Games to Transform Customer Service. Today you'll learn how GTR, the largest rail franchise in the UK, transformed their customer service with a transformation program using eLearning and the power of games to create re real behavioral change. We've got two presenters with us today. We have Toby White, who has been delivering award-winning e-learning for almost two decades. He specializes in helping create the type of e-learning that internal L&D teams would love to create but don't have the time to necessary, necessarily uh, have the necessary expertise. Excuse me. He is with Kaleidos. Also with us is Dante Frederick, who is an employee engagement officer for GTR, Britain's largest rail provider. He has recently spearheaded the One Step Ahead campaign to transform customer service at GTR through an incredibly effective learning campaign centered around using games to invoke behavioral change in the organization. And just a little side note, uh, you'll hear Dante. He lives in the UK, but uh, he is Canadian, so don't let the uh, accent fool you. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dante and Toby. Toby, I'm going to switch layouts for you. If you want to start sharing your screen, the floor is yours. Two seconds. There we are, far away, don't they? Brilliant. Great. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, Toby. Um, as Mel was saying, uh, GTR is the largest train operating company in the UK, and it's comprised of sort of four what we call brands, which are Southern Railway, uh, Gatwick Express, Thames Link, and Great Northern. And essentially, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background into kind of the context of the kind of organization we are and why this particular brand of e-learning was particularly challenging, but also significantly effective in, um, in some very kind of quantifiable ways. I'll get back to that in a little bit. Uh, so uh, the railways are privatized in the, in the UK. and. Um, part of a franchise system, and our franchise was created essentially to deliver what's called the Thameslink program, which is an upgrade to the, uh, the, the commuter railway system of uh, the greater London metropolitan area. And essentially we, were, we exist in order to take the network through this dramatic change, um, which is shifting over from uh, you know, a, a system which is, as I said, essentially what we're doing is we're taking a Victorian era commuter railway network and bringing it into a more sort of metro level um, uh, operational system in terms of how long trains are dwelling at stations, the frequency of service, the number of um, opportunities for people to different, make different choices about how they, how they travel. We're, the the Templin program is essentially about bringing about, what is, believe it or not, it's a 50% increase in capacity. So we run about, now we're running at about, about 3,600 3, trains a day. And as we go through, by the end of this massive upgrade, we'll have completed, increased our capacity by 50%. We're adding 10,000 more seats to peak times, about 1,500 new carriages. And this is all done through the Department for Transportation as a management contract. So we're all, it's all about, essentially, it's not so much about for us about making profit as it is about delivering on the commitment that we have to the government to sort of to, to make this upgrade happen. So obviously, it's quite a bit about boosting capacity, speeding up journeys, and giving these choices. And that mainly is happening by doing this uh, significant upgrade to the infrastructure, the trains themselves, the technology being used, the services being offered, uh, the, the way that information is exchanged, and finally, the behaviors um, of our uh, colleagues. So that's what we are setting out to do. The reason it's particularly challenging for this organization is because, as I said, it's part of a franchise that was created by the government bringing together four different companies some of which were previously fierce competitors, joining them into one, kind of smushing them together, vastly different cultures, cultures within cultures, trying to blend together and work as one. Uh, many of our existing systems at the time of integration, such as things like payroll and parts of IT and the communication networks, were not designed to speak to one another. Um, and we're also uh, introducing this sort of radical change to a population and a, uh, an, in, uh, sort of a, an industry that is not always so open to change, and certainly a population that um, has had to go through quite a bit of change in a short amount of time. And our demographics are essentially, um, well, basically our average worker is a uh, white male between the ages of 45 and 60, over 10 years on the job, with 
you can imagine, there's varying ranges of, uh, sort of technological savvy. We're also talking about when the system began, a real a lack of alignment through the IT systems, all kinds of different devices, different phones, different iPads, different tablets, something, sometimes nothing, um, and varying bandwidth cap capacities and so on and so forth. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about the sort of the context is we came in at a very sort of talk and chalk training culture. So people felt like if they weren't being sent away to spend the day in a classroom, they weren't really getting training. And you know, for those of you that are in the UK, this will all sound very familiar to you. Let's not forget that we're we've been going through one of the longest industrial relations disputes in the in UK history, which uh, part of that was also about quite a few missteps and stumbles with regard to the timetable upgrades, because there's a massive shift in the timetable um, last May. A lot of negative media attention, a lot of very unhappy customers, um, and a certain degree of a loss of public trust and from the staff as well. So that's sort of where we came into the, the environment we walked into to try and start setting about creating a new way of delivering customer service and making a change in the culture. But the good news is we're very committed to bringing about the change and finding a way to help our people bring them forward through this process, because it's been you know, as difficult as it has been for our customers, it's also been very hard on our staff. And change is something that um, is always challenging, uh, but particularly to the degree that we've been talking about. So as, as Mel was mentioning, we were created this, uh, this customer service training program called One Step Ahead, which is all focused on behavioral development. And we wanted to do this in a way that was a new way of, uh, of bringing people together, which that was going to be more engaging, that was not going to be sort of the same old thing, that was also going to be flexible to deal with different different populations, different age groups, people with varying different uh, abilities to get away from their day job. And that meant uh, creating a certain amount of blended learning. So people would come in and spend a day in the classroom. And then uh, most of them, we uh, like two thirds of our people were able to do that. Another third were actually never able to get released from their day jobs to do that in classroom. So we developed part of this program as a, um, an online version of that particular course. And then we moved into this other area, which was about um, creating this uh, material that was going to make people want. That was going to make people want to come to the material. It was going to create a, a desire for people to come and experience the work, experience the the, the content um, in a way that maybe they hadn't been before. So, what does that mean, and sort of how did we go about doing that? And that was all about looking at different ways. Uh, to present people with material, and because as you know, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are aware that a lot of different people have different learning styles. They respond to different kinds of learning. Um, so it was about, you know, with the, we have a staff of about 7,300. So it's trying to find a way that would be the most flexible, the most easily uh, moving into sort of an agile version of, of the work we've done in the past. And you know, to be honest, the, the, the the industry is a little bit behind the times. We're always working to catch up. But um, so we had to do this massive shift in culture. And that was uh, what One Step Ahead was all about. And that's when we went to Calidus to sort of say, right, what can, you, what can we do? How can you help us present this material in a way that people are going to find uh, not only informative, but engaging and interesting and, uh, dare I say it, even fun? So uh, that's what. Uh, Calidus's role was meant to be. Now, we provided them with the content in terms of what we wanted people to, to do, but um, they are the ones who came up with uh, the material, the way the content was delivered, and particularly the games, which have been really successful and quite popular. So I think at this point, I'm going to turn over to Toby and have him get into some more detail about how, how they actually did that, what it looked like, and um, what this sort of blended learning process uh, gave to us that we might not have had otherwise. Okay, thanks, Dante. Sorry, I should have been looking through your your slides as you were speaking. I was uh, waiting for a nudge. Um, we're going to show you quite oh, a bit of right. content. We, we, we're going to show you quite a bit of content today, um, both in terms of the e-learning modules and and the games as well. Um, there's some audio that you should be able to hear in a second as well. But um, it, uh, have a fiddle with your sets because, as we said earlier, we have tried to kind of get this so it all comes across okay. Um, the first thing to say is that um, this solution was a, a blend of multiple different things. So um, we're trying to 
fundamentally change behaviors in, in quite a challenging environment. Dante said the kind of typical age range was kind of 45 to 60 long-term employees who potentially weren't really up for change or specifically not up for technology and learning. Um, so we put um, a, a blend of different interventions together that included classroom training, um, but also e-learning and a game as well. And one of the first things we did was develop what we call a character set. So we, we have this idea of building a set of stories around a set of characters. The idea is, is you, you, you see these characters again and again. Each one character is a particular personality type, a particular type of customer. So to reinforce those customer types and to get people thinking about how to deal with them, we told stories with the same characters coming back in and back out all the same, like a soap opera. Um, so um, they, uh, we spent quite a bit of time. You can see some of them up here. We spent quite a bit of time designing them. Um, we could potentially have gone for video. Um, We've done that before in similar programs, but one of the challenges here was quite a large percentage of the population didn't have access to broadband. So um, building something that's a bit lighter was much more practical. Um, and there were there were other advantages to using kind of an illustration rather than video in that it doesn't age. Um, we can change things a lot more quickly. Um, so we came up with this kind of approach, these characters. Um, that we used, um, not just in digital learning as well. One of the um, the nice things was that Dante and his crew kind of recognized that we could use these to kind of produce um, collateral that could be used outside of the digital learning. So we um, we produced um, a cardboard cutouts. Um, and and it, it kind of annoys us quite a lot in what we do because we spend a lot of our time developing really nice, engaging digital e-learning. And then um, uh, it's not really the assets aren't used and they, they could be in screen savers they could be all over posters um you know I, I even wanted to have them on the back of toilet doors which apparently was a bit intrusive but um you, you get the idea we wanted to reuse these assets uh, as much as we can um so that's kind of the style i'm going to show you um uh, the first thing which was the trailer that we built for the program so the idea was we wanted to produce something that was maybe two minutes long to really grab the attention and kind of get people's expectations and understanding going. Um, you'll see it's quite rich. It's layered animation. Um, all of the e-learning took this approach. Um, I'll just jump straight in there. Hopefully you'll be able to see this OK. Now, before I click um, yes, you, you might notice the, the keen eye amongst you. This is built in a tool called Gomo. So this is a tool that is absolutely fantastic at producing adaptive content. So remember, a big chunk of the audience here have to access this through their smartphones, hence us taking this tool. But I'll, I'll jump straight in and let you have a look. Every day, people like you are out there helping our customers on their way. You're out there in all weathers making a difference to them in lots of ways. We know it's not easy, and let's face it, it's been a challenging time for many of us. But without you, customers wouldn't get the help and support that make their journey. You're an important part of their experience, and your hard work hasn't gone unnoticed. We've seen employees like you going out of their way to provide great customer service. We've seen you on the platform, dispatching trains with precision while customers queue for help. We've stood on the gate line as you anticipate customers' needs and take action on their behalf. It's you who delivers great customer service, day in and day out. So we want to provide the latest customer service training to support you and your colleagues. Let's take a look ahead and preview what's coming up in the program. So you, you get the idea um, of uh, the, the kind of style there. Um, we, uh, we that was, as I say, delivered maybe a couple of months before the e-learning went uh, went live. Um, uh, that one is, as I say, quite passive. You'll see it's quite different from the stuff I'm going to show you in a minute. But just to, to touch a little bit more on that tool, um, we went through various, went through Captivate storyline, uh, and we settled on Gomo because we found it to be, you know, quite simple. Um, I, I guess the fact that we were delivering to smartphones. Uh, meant that we were less interested, perhaps, in some of the functionality that you can get in other tools. Um, what we were more interested in is making sure we had a stable platform that could deliver content to people through multiple devices. Um, 
So um, let's uh, have a have a jump straight in and have a look at the, um, one of the main modules. I'm going to, you'll see, it's quite simple, as I say, in terms of interactivity. It follows a scenario-based approach um, where you kind of see it as a situation and something being dealt with in one way, and then you'll see it dealt with in another way. Jackie and her four-year-old daughter, Alice, are going to visit Jackie's mum this afternoon. With Alice's cerebral palsy, travelling can be challenging and often requires planning ahead. Jackie booked her off-peak tickets online, but the train she wanted has been cancelled. The next available train is travelling at peak time, so her existing tickets aren't valid. She couldn't change them using the ticket machine, so she joins the queue at the ticket counter. It's Jackie's turn next. Let's see two different ways that her experience could go. It's Jackie's turn at the ticket counter. Let's see what happens when her situation is handled poorly. Hi, I booked online for the 3.45 but it was cancelled. These are the tickets I collected from the machine. I'd like to travel on the next train at no extra cost, please. The next train is a peak time one, so your tickets aren't valid? Yes, I know. That's why I'm standing here changing them. I want you to give me valid tickets, but I don't want to pay extra. You don't want to pay for peak time tickets? That's right. Well, the next available off-peak train is at 1900. No, if I wanted to travel this evening, I would not be standing here having this conversation with you in the middle of the afternoon. I bought valid tickets to travel this afternoon on an off. We've had fantastic feedback. I think one of the things that you have to pay attention to when you're creating this kind of content is the authenticity. So creating, you know, we spent time actually on the cold front listening to these conversations and little things like their uniforms are absolutely bang on, even though they're um, uh, illustrative. So there's a, a real attention to um, creating something that's authentic. Um, at the same time, it's it's not a, a cheap way of producing e-learning. Um, this, that, that this kind of material was taking kind of 70 days each module to develop, um, so quite costly um, to do that. Um, it, obviously, the illustrations themselves took a lot of time. Um, we've got multiple voiceover artists appearing throughout it, and we've even synced um, the way the lips speak with the um, uh, with, with it as well. So. Uh, it's a relatively rich experience, but again, the reason that was absolutely critical because we're trying to connect with uh, an audience who are probably not up for this in the first place. So we've got to do so much in terms of the design, the authenticity, the engagement to, to try and get them to come on the journey. Um, so just to finish off, I'm going to show you a few snippets that we've developed from a, we've built a couple of games so far um, that have been formed part of this. Um, so the, the games, the way they were used was kind of more to embed the learning and to uh, encourage more usage. So the idea was we build games, we allow people to compete, we give out prizes to, to um, get them to incentivize them to, to do it, um, and, and to pull them into the start of the digital learning experience. I think Dante will speak about this more later, but remember this is only the first or second piece of digital learning these guys have ever accessed. So it's really important they have a positive experience the first or second time because they're never going to come back again if the first thing they see is some turgid piece of compliance learning that's like click next take test it's just not going to work so let's have a quick jump in um this is a collage there's a lot of sound in the background but i'm just going to kind of give you the gist of what's going on here so we had a family called the shars who were going to take a journey across london and your mission as the, the uh, learner or the gamer if you like is to get them there on time. So as they go on their journey, they, you're going to see um, the, the route that they take displayed on a hub. Um, here we go, and you can see where they've stopped and the, where they've um, had delays and what the effect's been. Here you can see the, the little bit of comms going out to them, telling them that they're going to get some, um, some prizes if they do well at this quiz. Um, and what follows now is just a collage of various different types of learning interventions. Uh, sorry, of questioning. So we've got some fairly simple things like um, multi-choices here. Obviously, they're given feedback on the multi-choices, whether they get it right or wrong. Um, and um, 
the next thing you're going to see is a, this is more of a kind of simulative question. So one of the things Dante's talked about is getting more people to go through the train system. So this is a, a lot of operational stuff here. This is about blowing the whistle at the right time before the train takes off. So you'll see the countdown um, to the train taking off. And then rather than answering a question, you've actually got to blow the whistle at the right time, which there you go. That's the only bit of sound we've actually got left in it. But that's the, the whole basis of this. Um, next next type of question, you've got a scenario. So you've got a passenger who's going to be sick on the train um, on the right there. And you've got to work out what process that you should follow to get that person off the train um, uh, with the minimum disruption, but obviously looking after them as well. So there's quite a lot of different types of question. Um, later on, we see tannoy announcements, and we compare how those are given. We don't have a fantastic reputation for delivering um, public um, uh, PA messages um, in, in this country, so it's kind of almost a bit humorous. Um, and then I think the last bit we show here is that, yeah, we, we, we use, because we've got 7,000 people doing this learning, if you want to give out prizes, you can't just let them all go through a half hour quiz. You're going to have not going to have very much breadth. So what we did was we created a bonus round where learners could go to a stage and then gamble to go on. Um, if they gamble to go on and play on, they can either bank points or they can move on and get more. So what this did is it gave us a big breadth of results. So it gave us made it much easier to create a winner and a loser. Um, as I say, this is. It's quite unusual, quite a big change for us. Over the last two years, we have seen not just talk of gamification, but talk of games. So um, we're building another uh, um, kind of similar program from another train company at the moment. I think we're on game number 13 in the last 18 months. So this is one of the big changes we've noticed in our industry over here is not just talking about point scoring or scenarios, but actually building genuine programs. And this is actually kind of one of, one of the kind of... Um, more conservative ones that we produce. Um, but I'm going to hand you back over to Dante now, um, just to let him explain to you about the, the impact that this has had um, within in the business. Yeah, thanks, Toby. So I think it's, it, what's exciting about this kind of material is that you get a chance to kind of see uh, pretty quickly how it's playing in terms of how much uptake happens. because. Um, you can even when it's made compulsory, people will either do it or they will just decide not to. We have um, quite a robust history of saying no uh, when it comes to um, sort of our frontline staff, and, and especially when we're talking about uh, something that you know is sometimes described as a soft skill. So customer service behaviors they can sort of be hard to quantify. It is true we're sort of in earlier days now. The last so there's a National Rail Passenger Survey that happens twice a year. The last survey came out right after we had massive disruption due to timetables, and also most of our people hadn't even started or had just begun to do the e-learning, so it was, didn't really give us a good idea of what was uh, the results. But we're looking forward to the one that comes out in a couple of weeks, which will give us a little bit more of kind of clear, quantifiable numbers. Um, but still, we can look and dig in a little bit and sort of see some pockets of good news that uh, come out from our monthly customer experience surveys. and how much praise comes out of things like you know social media and emails and so on so on and so forth. So as of now, so we started the program late in the summer, uh, last summer, 2018, and to date, about 79% of all of our customer-facing staff and their managers or supervisors have completed all of the e-learning. Um, over the course of that time, customer complaints about staff have dropped about 50 50%, uh, which is quite significant. Uh, customer praise of staff has risen about 25% since January. Um, and uh, our, one of our brands, Gatwick Express, which had had a real struggle in past days, uh, hit about 80% of uh, their, so their highest customer service scores ever. Now, of course, it's always hard to sort of draw a direct, direct link. But um, certainly, we've noticed a shift in terms of, uh, now, part of that is that the service is getting better. But there is also, even when the service is bad, people notice when they're how they're being treated. And people tend to, you know, our experience has been that the things that people praise us for tend to be our people, and the things that people complain about tend to be more about sort of service and operations. Um, so we're we're so we're showing uh, you know better scores with our with our public, but we're also showing our employee engagement rates have gone up 24 percent since 
2016, which was at when the project first began. Um, so we've had a lot of uh, anecdotal and, and um, certainly praise coming in about our people. And as I said, we're looking forward more specifically to that big national um, rail public sur uh, sorry, passenger survey that comes out in a couple of weeks to let us have an understanding better of um, how it's going down in terms of the customer. But I think what's important to talk about, um, and depending on your industry, I think this will have um, some, for some of you, it will be quite significant as well. And what matters to me is the, in my role, is about how things are shifting for us as a culture. So we're, you know, we're constantly bringing in new generations, new joiners, um, new ideas, new ways of looking at things. Uh, when we started, something like 80% of our staff didn't even have, or, or if they had it, they didn't use their, their company email address. Um, the variety of devices made it nearly impossible to connect, and many people who had devices, they just sort of sat in lockers or, drawer, or drawers and were not engaged with. Um, but then starting with an accessibility and equality module, which is the first thing that Caledus built for us, and then that game, which was the Pit Stop Challenge, which is all about getting us to a metro level uh, dwell times in terms of you know, making sure that we were getting pe things on track as far as uh, speed of getting people on and off the trains as safely as possible. Um, and literally all of our customer-facing staff did those two modules. And it was challenging, but they all did them. Um, now all of our staff have a, a, a company email address. Um, recently we launched a uh, reward and recognition portal called Starhub, and there was 85% registration and interaction with that content there. And you had to use your email address, your, your company email address, in order to do that. So that just show, I mean, we've gone, so literally we've gone from about 25% to 85% interaction with, uh, with the technology that's available to our staff over the course of the last two years. And I, I really believe that a lot of that has to do with the fact that this, this content has helped them, many people who are not comfortable with the technology, sort of get over that leap, and particularly when it comes down to so the, last, the, the last thing that people do after they, there's, there's uh, six modules in the One Step Ahead online learning. The last piece is the One Step Ahead game, which is the assessment tool. So they're not tested, per se. They, they, have, they give an answer or not, and they get a, you know, a reaction to that. They, let, they know whether they've been correct or not, but they're not actually tested in terms of the One Step Ahead material until the game. So the game is not only about kind of uh, having a good time, it's also that's the way we sort of are able to track how much they've, they've been able to absorb. And uh, we, so there was quite a competition. We gave away all sorts of prizes, and it was really important to, for us to do that. And that's where we get to our 79% of our customer-facing staff. The game was quite uh, engaging it was also the, the, the competition between stations and between depots uh, was sort of spirited and, and but in, in a lot of good fun and it essentially broke the seal in terms of people getting used to using the technology that was available to them when they really were not comfortable doing that um, and as examples you know there are pockets now a hundred percent of our onboard staff from uh, a big station that called East Croydon which who have not have not historically been a particularly, uh, they've been quite a challenging population to get to do the learning. In fact, we, they were the hardest population to get released through the classroom, but 100% of them have done all of the e-learning months ago now. So there's a real shift that we're seeing. People are engaging with the content. The content is not only um, interesting and fun, it's in small, manageable learning bites. People can take five to seven minutes on their smartphone, as Toby said, and do something when they have a moment. We can see that the tide is beginning to turn. People don't and the organization don't look at online learning as such a strange thing the way they did when I was first trying to go around and convince them that it was something they needed to do. But um, I mean, we still have a lot of work to do, and you know, we're, we're the service, as I said, has made a dramatic improvement. But I've also seen an improvement in the way that people are, are their comfort level and their uptake as far as um, the sort of the digital uh, destination, which is another initiative we have going. We're trying to get ourselves bring the the organization into the 21st century and bring it into the digital era, and it's happening. And I'll tell you, when I, when I joined the company three years ago, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I, I, well, let's just say I was, I was cautiously optimistic, but the cautiously was more on the, uh, that, that was probably the, the more strong emotion I felt. Um, but I really feel as though people are, are making a change. They're really finding themselves 
getting over that lump. And for, for me, that tends, is the most dramatic shift that I've seen. And uh, if we can do it, you can do it in an organization where you know, you've got people sitting in a ticket office. And I, I, I go through a station every day where the person in the ticket office has been there literally 30 years in that ticket office. And she basically said very clearly to me, I've never, you know, done anything on my phone except talk on the phone and I don't intend to start. And that, she's been one of our, our biggest advocates because she sort of, uh, she, well, part of it is she won a prize because she, <laughs> because she completed the, the, on learning, the, on, the online learning in time. And part of it, I think, is because she actually enjoyed doing it. And as Sophia said, you know, where all the material is about, um, it has to be relevant. And these people are very operational and procedurally focused. You know, if it's not right, they're going to tell you. They're going to notice, and they're going to tell you. Um, even if it's about, you know, the, the, the color of their tie or the direction of their name tag or whatnot, they're, they're going to let, it, let you know. So it was very important that we get all of that right, and then we present people, um, you know, avatars that were recognizable, that looked like our population, that talked like the population. We did a lot of work on um, getting the right actors and the right voices. Um, into the into the, the scenarios, um, but essentially the gamification, the game itself, was just about giving people access, helping people get through that barrier that that many people felt. Now you know we had people coming in to the organization recently, or uh, who did it without even thinking about it, who did it at home on their own time, you know, because they were that's the kind of relationship they have to technology. But a lot of our staff did not have that. And so we really had to work very hard to get them there. But um, in terms of engagement and um, kind of digital adoption, the, this tool has been instrumental in getting us to where we need to be. And I believe, you know, I, I see the, the monthly scores going up in terms of customer service. Um, and I believe that there is a, a central part of that is about the content being created in the right format and the right you know, delivery tool. So I think that, um, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the next survey coming out. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to, um, you know, uh, communicate that through various award ceremonies. That's something that Toby and I are always talking about, because I do feel that the material is um, worthy of that. So um, that's kind of my take on the the closing. Again, it's all about culture, and I'd be interested if uh, anyone has any you know, further questions as well. Okay, we did have some, some questions uh, coming in. Was everything that you showed, was all that with GOMO Learning? I mean, people weren't sure. Um, the, the, um, I should have said, actually, the game, we moved away from GOMO for the game because um, with, with GOMO, it's, as I say, very good from an adaptive perspective, but from a functionality point of view, it was um, not as good as Storyline. So the games we built in Storyline, the e-learning and the trailer is built in GOMO, so the, the, the majority of it is GOMO, um, but the games have got quite complex scoring mechanisms and more buttons to press, so the, the more buttons there are to press, the more difficult that is if you're accessing it on a, on a four-inch screen. So we went to Storyline. Ah, uh, yes, I've developed that way too. <clears throat> um, how did the employees feel using their personal mobile devices for e-learning? Was there any pushback? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, so our our employees, most of our employees have um, have a company issued smartphone. It has. There's a lot, as you can imagine. There's a lot of apps um, and various sort of uh, kind of technical bits of information they have to have at their fingertips, particularly um, uh, station staff. So they all have a a, a a company issued smartphone. So for the most part, a, a people were you know obviously they weren't fussed about doing it at their work phone. But I'll tell you, I had. Quite a few people say, you know what? I didn't really have time to do it at home, at work. I'd, you know, I feel more comfortable doing it on my own on my iPhone, and so I just did it at home on my iPhone. So it, it kind of depends on their degree of, of you know engagement and and, and um, how how clear that line they have between home and work, which I completely understand. But um, in terms of that, it made it much better. It made it easier for us that most people have their own device uh, issued by the company. Okay, great, thanks. And did you make the this training mandatory? Well, that's the fact. Yes, we did. We didn't, but we didn't exactly say that. So what I mean to say is, we didn't say to them, "You have to do this." Um, 
we just said if you want to win the big prizes, you have to do all the modules because you can't do the game without doing all the modules and all the big prizes are in the game. And the big prizes were things like you know, a, significant, a, a really nice laptop um, or a really nice uh, um, Bluetooth headphones or whatnot. And that was built into the, into the, um, the budget. But at the same time, um, most of it was about the, the, the line manager saying to their people, you know, this, uh, sort of you, you know, like a lot of companies, we do employee engagement surveys. And, and a lot of the, the, the response we get every year is that people want, they're hungry for more training, more development, an opportunity to sort of upskill as much as possible in terms of, you know, the work they do. And so this was very, really presented to them as, look, here's an opportunity to do some really innovative, you know, um, uh, development for yourself. Uh, I, I expect you to, to do this work and uh, for us to sit down and have a chat about it at our next team meeting. So most of it was done internal, like locally, rather, rather than a sort of um, an edict from on high. But yeah, basically, it was all it was all mandatory. And we have a great question from Chris about kind of capturing what kind of data were you capturing from the games? What particular competencies were you trying to get your staff to demonstrate and how do you know that there was a behavior change because of the game-based learning? Right, well, and, that, and that's, always, that's always the challenge, isn't it, with this kind of material. So in terms of what we were capturing from the games, part of it was simply, um, you know, of course, A, a did they do it? Um, how long, how much time did they spend doing it? Um, when did they do it? And how often did they go in and out? Because again, each module had about six or seven what we call learning bites of about five minutes each, so they could dip in and out at their leisure, as far as you know, or their convenience rather. Um, and uh, and then essentially the game was about testing them on how well they'd absorb the concepts. The ones that had concepts are a lot of like, are basically like dealing with different behavioral types. It's sort of the um, uh, something called insights or colors. It's kind of the same sort of uh, um, system. It's similar, it's similar uh, vocabulary, but Basically, what they did is, uh, so, so we could test them on whether they'd absorb the content. Uh, in terms of have they actually changed their behaviors, the only way we can actually track that is by getting, by understanding uh, how customers are perceiving those behaviors. And that comes mostly down to our monthly customer service um, sort of pulse surveys. And then, as I said, the sort of annual um, national rail passenger surveys. So um, hope, we're hoping to see some significant movement in those specific uh, employee behavior questions that part of the survey uh, coming up in next. If week. I can just chip in there as, as well, um, we, we've done another similar program with another um, southern um, rail organization called TFL, Transport for London, um, and um, similar thing, games, e-learning, and one of the things that they, they did and we may do here in time is uh, we used the Mystery Shopper program, and that what they did was they did the survey that Dante was talking about, but the other thing they did was they tracked the movement of staff because um, part of the people who were going to be dealing with the customers there didn't used to, and what they noticed was that the movement of staff changed afterwards, and that to me is a real golden nugget because that is a genuine behavioral change, and it was a similar thing, game-based mm -hmm. learning, complex scenarios. They used video rather than animation, um, but again, very similar demographic. So. We kind of know this works, and this, this is becoming one of the places that we, we're getting, um, doing more and more work in terms of behavioral change, because it, it needs something that maybe isn't your typical e-learning. Yeah, that's right. So the ever popular question that always comes is, how long did it take to implement, and what did it cost? Yeah. <laughs> not, as, not, not as quickly as we'd have liked, I think, is probably the honest answer, Dante. Yeah, I'm afraid that's very true. We were, you know, as you can imagine, we were going through a lot of uh, changes at that time, and so we essentially we, uh, you know, they're it's very dependent on. Um, the great thing about this collaboration is that the developers are very dependent on feedback. Certainly, they're, they're dependent on us taking the material, showing our stakeholders, showing our our you know sort of representatives from the staff what they're seeing, and then coming back with. Um, um, their, feed, their, their notes, their feedback about what's working and what's not. And, uh, you know, and, and that saved us a few times because there were a couple of times when they came back and said, well, you know, that train doesn't actually run at that station. And then we'd have to go, oh, okay, well, we better change that because otherwise people are going to scream bloody murder if they see, you know, because, people, again, these are real people. They don't make those mistakes. But so I think, Toby, what, the game itself, you'll have to help me with this a little bit, is usually about what, like, is it about 
No, this team actually took us probably about six months. It, it? it did. I mean, the program, the whole program, the original intentions were to do the whole thing over a year and drip it. Um, I think the game, the two games, the um, the e-learning, and then the, we, before we did all of this, we did a kind of tester on accessibility and inclusion. That whole that whole process probably took about fifteen months. The whole thing. Yeah, that sounds right. Probably not the right place to be talking about you, talking uh, about cost. I don't know <laughs> if I should be that open. But as I said to you, I mean, it wasn't a low cost thing. Each one of those modules was forty five minutes long. Um, and took us um, uh, 60 to 70 man days. Um, so you can you probably work it out from there. That's not all um, a linear man days. Obviously, there are multiple people working on, on each of these, these projects. So you, you, you're talking a kind of when we, most of the people in the UK, so we still price per hour of e-learning. Um, this is probably around the kind of from the 35, 40k an hour mark, which is towards the richer end of what we do when it gets more expensive when we start using video. And and I think it's a great example. So definitely a high end. And I think for those who might be, you know, listening and maybe don't have the budget, you can do very effective game games um, at a lower um, as well, but not to the scale <laughs> for sure. So um, how many people participated uh, in total with this? You mean? Oh, yeah, so our, we have a, yeah, I was going to say, if you're talking about actual p users, um, it's about, for, for us it was about 20, 2,800, 2,800, that's sort of users and their, their line managers, and then there were probably another two, 200 kind of exec level who were just used it as a way of kind of exploring the material. And um, what aspects of the game was most effective, you know, based on the feedback you've, you've gotten, you know, now that it's been out, what aspect of the games was most effective? Mm. I think, for, for, especially for the One Step Ahead game, um, what was most effective, so I think they're, they're different for every game, right? For the One Step Ahead game, I think it was very effective that there were four different characters, each of them on a different, um, Kind of tr uh, journey, so it gave people the opportunity to test these behavioral, you know, skills in a lot of different scenarios. Um, and but it was also that it was, I mean, I think in some ways that's in terms of kind of I guess the learning. But as far as what the, the, the what people really reacted to and responded to is they liked the visuals. They liked the fact that okay, sometimes I'm looking at a scene, sometimes I'm looking at a scene from uh, you know bird's eye, sometimes I'm looking at. Uh, uh, traveling along uh, a track. Sometimes I'm looking at a map. Sometimes I'm looking at you know starbursts and uh, bonus records and all kinds of other. So it's it's very uh, engaging in terms of variety and um, visual stimulation. Um, I think with the pit stop, uh, it was because there were part of that was behavioral and part of that was also you know sort of operational. Um, it was again it was about that variety and trying to sort of hit all those different marks because you know one person is going to really respond to. Um, one visual and another one's going to respond to dragging bits and dropping them in special places to answer questions. So it's, it's about, I think games give you such an incredible variety as far as the ways you want to, to, to convey that information. And the, I think the other bit is, and I just want to say this, is that, uh, you know, we did a lot of, uh, the part of our bonus questions in the game were um, trivia questions about the railway, which were all submitted and, you know, to us by our staff, because we got some people who are real trained fanatics out there, and that really was also something that actually, you know, helped engage, because they thought, oh, well, our people are the ones that came up with these questions, and they quite like that. So this is a, a two-part from two different uh, folks, but um, how many modules were created all together, and do you have plans for future modules? So there were, oh, right. there were seven modules of the core e-learning content. There were two games, mm -hmm. and then there was an accessibility and inclusion kind of pilot module. So there you've got eight modules, two games. And in terms of the future, we've already, uh, it's interesting what happens. When you, when you create a piece of e-learning like this that creates an impact and people use, I know as an e-learning development organization, this is the best shot window we can have. 
So since then, we've built e-learning around. They have these smart cards that they use. They go in and out of stations. We're building a very cool 3D, kind of very gamey course around that at the moment. We've also built content around new systems. Um, it's just a start, really. I mean, it, that's what's fantastic about doing what we do, I think. E even in this day and age, there's still massive organizations out there that are only just starting to use digital learning content. That's why getting the tone, getting the interactivity, getting it all right is fundamental. Um, and, you know, conversely, if you, if you roll out a piece of kind of flat content to people who are used to nice-looking media on their PC at home, there's only one reaction you're going to get, and it's not going to be positive. And I can attest to that, having been in the, doing virtual instructor-led training for 20 years. If you don't roll it out, implement it, they don't, they think it's terrible, and they don't want to do it <laughs> the rest of the organization. So first impressions really do make a big uh, impact. Yep. Um, was there any supplemental materials utilized after the e-learning for retention? So there is, uh, for, the, um, like for the accessibility, yeah, that there, uh, accessibility e-learning in, in was um, in a sort of in uh, part of a larger package of classroom events and team briefs and uh, a whole variety of things because accessibility training is constantly going on and, um, throughout the course of the organization. Uh, for the pit stop, there were also printed materials and um, that people have. I think Z cards they carried around with them, uh, Z cards with little, you know, expandable information uh, kind of pocket wallets that they had. And they also had the same, the Z card um, kind of like, I mean, I call it a cheat sheet. They wouldn't call it that, but that's something that people could carry with them in the station to use as well. That's for the one step ahead overall. One step ahead, because of the, the, the breadth of it, um, we're still rolling people through it, so um, and including all new joiners who go through the One Step Ahead course, the classroom event. Um, so that one, uh, as of now, doesn't have a supplemental material because basically the the e-learning was supplemental to the classroom. So um, that was how that works. But if we're, as far as the other two, yeah, there's uh, printed materials and posters, and as uh, Toby had, you know mentioned, sort of cardboard cutouts and all these other visual cues to help people reconnect with the ideas. So this is a, a, a really great question. How do new employees starting now or in six months participate in the game or compete for the prize? Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm sure they have that same question. Um, so these new employees, they, they do the classroom event as part of their induction, and then they'll be sort of asked to complete the online learning as it rolls out um, you know, over the course of the next year. But essentially now, uh, one step ahead has become sort of a business as usual. So it's not they, they don't participate in the games anymore or compete for prizes anymore. That was sort of the the impetus to get, as I was talking, I guess a little bit earlier about getting that shift to get people onto the material. Whereas now people walk in and they get the material right away and they're just sort of like, oh, this is part of my job. Um, it, it isn't presented in that in quite a, the same way. They don't get the same incentives. Um, but at the same time. Um, they're also sort of embracing it just as, oh, this is just another tool to help me do my job better. And did you do something to get the managers to be part of making learners do the modules? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was all, I mean, our line managers are the most important part of this process in terms of, um, you know, engagement with the material. So the line managers are, are given, you know, weekly reports, talking to them about um, who in their team has done what and how much they've done and what they've struggled with. Um, and we're, the, all of these materials were first presented to the line. The line managers do the materials first so that they have a chance to experience it, go through all the bumps, ask all the questions, um, and then they're kind of ready to support their own teams and, and going through the material as well. Okay, well, I'm not seeing, uh, I see people typing, so let's see if any more questions come in. So you still have time, but there was one from Israel earlier on about if there was a place where you know people could see or interact with more demos, so like what you showed, if there's a place, there's a, um, maybe we, Kaleidos has something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got a um, uh, our own content website is calidusconsent.com, and you will find a showcase a show reel on there, um, and it shows you some of the work we've done with people like McDonald's and Barclays and DHL. 
Um, it's very kind of snapshotty, um, but it will give you an idea, and then you can just ping us there an inquiry through the website if, uh, if, if you want to know more information. I can see a question about. Uh, great, and then we. Sorry, I was just saying. I, I can. Yep, go ahead. That's I can see a question that. about yeah, about the ahead, LMS go. there. Um, so Calidus has got our own learning management system, which is um, called Learn, um, and that was implemented. I, I think GTR, Dante, were the first Learn customer. So uh, um, yeah, yeah, that's quite brave. But the platform, uh, that's a critical thing as well. Obviously, if you've got a load of learners who are going to be accessing your content through smartphone devices. It, it's still amazing how many large corporates don't have. Um, they might have lovely content, but if if the platform can't handle a uh, smartphone device, then they're scuppered from the the first first word. So um, yeah, they have uh, Calibus Learn. Uh, so the entire solution was rolled out through that. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions here. So before we officially wrap up. I'll hand it back over to Toby and Dante just to say any final uh, thoughts and then we'll bring up the final evaluation and I do encourage people to stay on and maybe provide us some quick feedback. So Toby and Dante? Just thank you very much for listening guys. Um, obviously we are sadly, well I am sadly excited by uh, my e-learning world so if um, you guys have got any uh, equivalent stories we're always wanting to share so um, so get in contact through the website is probably the easiest way from that perspective. I don't know, Dante, if you wanted to say anything. Yeah, I would, I would just encourage you to explore it because I, I, I just have found it to be, um, especially if you have a challenging population, you know, you have to sort of take kind of whatever avenue you can to find your way to connect with them. And, um, you know, not everyone's going to connect with this. I mean, I'll be honest with you, we had a couple of, you know, a handful of people that were that hated it. But they, you know, the, <laughs> they were in the vast, vast minority. Most people were um, were quite intrigued and brought in and found it to be uh, a really exciting new way for them to get um, what we wanted them to get. So uh, I would definitely encourage you to to uh, look into it and to uh, not be afraid of gamifying any material you have.